So you may have noticed that today I'm going to speak on the subject of revival. <laughs> and revival is a massive subject and there are all sorts of views, uh, opinions, and uh, arguments about this subject. And so, to be honest with you, today you're hearing what I think. <laughs> and see what you make of it. Uh, okay. And so, I believe that revival is a powerful and sovereign move of God that has a huge impact, not only upon the church, but upon the communities where the church happens to be based. And that can actually be a street, it can be a village, a town, a city, even a county, even a nation. The American preacher, Tim Keller, uh, said this, he said, in times of revival, we see three things. Sleepy Christians wake up. Nominal Christians are brought to faith. And as a result of those two things, people with no faith encounter God and they find Him. And they are dramatically transformed as a result. And I want to suggest to you that revivals always include a recovery of some of the things that we find in the book of Acts. I believe the Book of Acts is a unique period in history. I, I dare to say there are no revivals in the Book of Acts because you can't revive something that hasn't already happened. And because the Book of Acts is the birth of the church, it is unique. But revivals, I believe, do what they say on the tin. They revive certain aspects which are so clear and so evident at that particular point in history. And so, just to start with, we're going to spend a moment or two recalling those incredible and those miraculous and those wonderful stories recorded right at the beginning by this writer Luke as the church kicks off. And so we start just looking at different bits. And I'm just going to summarise some of the chapters of the book of Acts. So, for example, in Acts chapter 2, of course, we've got the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes on, on in power on the believers as they are praying and as they're worshipping God. It's the beginning of a new era. And Peter stands up and he proclaims the truth of Jesus' death, he proclaims the truth of Jesus' resurrection, and literally thousands of people repent and turn to God right. as a result of this. Right. Uh, then we move into Acts chapter 4, and there's this wonderful statement in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, which says this, But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. 5,000. 5,000. And that, that seems to be the men. Later in Acts 4, from verse 23, we read about this wonderful and powerful prayer meeting where the Christians were uh, calling on God. And the presence of God, it says, was so tangible, it said that the place they were meeting was shaken. Hallelujah. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak the word of God boldly. And then Acts 5, we read this, this one little statement, which simply says, and more and more were added to the church. Boom. In Acts 8, we read about the mighty works of God as Philip the Evangelist, he goes and he preaches in a city, and it simply says this, there was great joy in that city. And then in Acts 10, we find Peter, he's having his time of prayer, and as a result of Peter coming before God and praying, um, as a result of that, we find that he is called and sent to Cornelius and a whole load of non-Jews. And, and he preaches to them. And as he preaches, the Holy Spirit spontaneously comes upon these guys. And they are displaying gifts of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and they're completely empowered by God and moved so powerfully by God that Peter doesn't have a chance to finish his sermon. Because something so extraordinary has happened. And so these are just some of the examples of some of the things that we see just in the first 10 chapters. I haven't even got to Paul's ministry. Uh, and I'm just going to pause there and, and just move on there. But it's just a sense of actually what God did at that time. But I believe there are many elements which um, re-emerge. Many elements that we've just examined here and just recorded here and just mentioned here that re-emerge during times of revival. And so... A couple of years ago, Helen and I felt stirred to go and visit places where revivals had taken place. We weren't really sure why, but we thought we would. And so we did. 
And so, over the last three years, along with Hilary, right at the back, and Gemma, who seems to be scooting back in through the door. Wow, she can't stop the whole of my talk. She's like, that. Let's have a little break. Uh, Gemma and Hilary from, from Grace Church, and also John and Joe Young and Peter Young from Barnabas, who've actually been able to come. I invited them because we were talking about this. So let's just w welcome John and Joe oh. and Peter. <laughs> for the last really to be here. So, so we all went, um, the seven of us, went on these little adventures, visiting revival sites, praying in churches and chapels where God had previously moved so powerfully. Uh, and recently, Helen and I were praying with Hillary and Gemma, and I, I just felt stirred that I wanted to share something of those revival stories with you uh, at Grace Church. Now, it's not going to be holiday snaps. Um, there's no photos of me and John surfing, because we didn't. Um, uh, although I was really tempted, Joe and I had built this incredible sandcastle at St. Michael's Mount, which is almost a, almost a replica of St. Michael's Mount. And I wanted, I wanted that on the screen, but I haven't, I've resisted. So simply, we're going to just talk about some of the stories of the revivals that happened in the UK and see how, to some extent, they echo some of the things that I've mentioned in the Book of Acts. And so I've decided to look at them in date order rather than the order that we visited them, because actually our visits are in reverse order of the dates. Um, so we start in the 18th century. A long time ago, even before I was born. And we focus our attention on one of my favourite places in the whole wide world. Cornwall. I love Cornwall. For any Devon people here today, sorry. Evangelists John and Charles Wesley travelled from London to Cornwall and began to preach. And this is where our trip took us this last year, just a couple of months ago. But prior to their trips to Cornwall, we find that the Wesley brothers were involved in regular prayer meetings in London before they went from London to Cornwall. And these regular meetings would last for many, many hours. John Wesley writes in his journal in 1739 about these prayer meetings. This is what he says. The first lines of it are is about three in the morning, as we continued in prayer, the power of God came mightily upon us, insomuch that many cried out for exceeding joy, and many fell to the ground. As soon as we were recovered a little, I love that, as soon as we were recovered a little from the, the awe and amazement at the presence of His Majesty, isn't that beautiful? We broke out with one voice. We praise Him, God. We acknowledge Thee to be our Lord. And so they went on the back of these prayer meetings and they preached in Cornwall and following their visits, about, they had a number of visits and a year after they'd been visiting, this is what John, this is what, sorry, Charles Wesley wrote in his diary after a year of their mission to Cornwall. It says this, here a little one has become a thousand. What an amazing work God hath done in one year. The whole county is alarmed and has gone forth after the sound of the gospel. Our preachers are daily pressed to new places and enabled to preach five or six times a day. A day. I love the wording, don't you? The whole county is alarmed and has gone forth after the sound of the gospel. <laughs> what are you talking about, Charles? Isn't that just fantastic? And so this revival in Cornwall, it's centred on prayer. God's people were awakened to and filled with a passion to prayer. Now these meetings were not evangelistic in nature, they were prayer meetings. But their effect was incredibly powerful. For six hours they would pray. Get that right? So they were praying for six hours. Then they would stop at 9am. Yes, I know. And then they would go home and spend some time with their families. They would reconvene in the evening. And what God has started in the morning, he would continue in the evening. The prayer meetings continued for many, many months. By March of 1782, the frequent prayer meetings would last until at least midnight. So, that was Cornwall. And we had the privilege of praying in some of the chapels and some of the houses 
that John Wesley ministered in and Charles Wesley ministered in, as well as places like Gwenap Pitt, where it's said that John preached to over 30,000 people, many of them tin miners from that area. We were in one particular chapel, and Joe can play the organ, and we sang, and can it be that I should gain a wonderful, wonderful Charles Wesley hymn. Last year, we had the privilege of visiting the revival sites along the nation of Wales. Reminding us what happened in 1904 to 1905, a man called Evan Roberts was used powerfully by God during that time. Evan Roberts was 12 years old when he was sent down the mines to join his father in the coal mines of Wales. And he was often seen by the other miners on his knees in the dust, in the dirt of the coal mine, seeking God, reading his Bible. Gemma and Hilary and I had the great opportunity to go to the Welsh National Museum, which still had a copy of that very Bible that he used in the pit. And they got it all wrapped up and they kept it safe and they unwrapped it for us and we were allowed to look at it. I was allowed to hand it, I got dust on my hands, coal dust on my hands as a result. It's not entirely clear when um, Evan Roberts became a Christian, but by the time he was 13, he was definitely saved. He was in regular attendance at a chapel called Mariah Chapel, a church about a mile from his home. And for years, this young man spent hours praying for, and he described it as this, a revival of religion in the nation of Wales. A great turning point in Evan's life was when he visited a meeting at Blynanach. Sorry, Steve Pector. Blynanach. That's, that's the best thing to see. Uh, and this is, he describes at that meeting what happened to him, and this is what he says. He says, I felt a living, I love the, I love the ancient texts here, aren't they fantastic? I, I, I felt a living power pervading my bosom. Have you said that? <laughs> it took my breath away and my legs trembled exceedingly. I fell on my knees with my arms over the seat in front of me. I cried out, bend me, bend me. It was God's commending love which bent me. What a wave of peace flowed, flooded my bosom. And then he goes on to say this, I was filled with compassion for those who must bend at the judgment, and I wept. Following that, I love this, the salvation of the human soul was solemnly impressed on me. I felt ablaze with the desire to go the length and breadth of Wales, to tell of the Saviour. And so he did. And during 1904 to 1905, thousands of people were saved. Public houses became empty. Men and women used to waste their money on drinking. Were now saving it, they were giving it to the church, they were using their money to buy clothes and food for their families. Stealing and other offences became less and less. The magistrate would come to court and find there would be no cases for him to try. Even the cursing and the bad language changed. The miners put in a better day's work than they had ever had in the coal pits. But the pit ponies couldn't understand what they were saying because they were no longer swearing at them. So the pit, the, the pit ponies became disobedient and because they might be being swore at, they didn't know what to say. They were completely confused. People who used to fight, forgave each other, and there was reconciliation. And society was changed. The nation of Wales, it was said, became, for a time, a God-fearing nation. Finally, our very first trip was to the Hebrides. Just after lockdown, we were able to go. We were still having to wear masks in various places. But uh, this happened in 1949. So it's in the lifetime of some of the people I'm being careful when I go my eyes. Somebody may have been alive at that point. Um, two old women named Peggy and Christine Smith, one of them 84, the other 82, they took it upon themselves to pray until revival came. And they spent hours in prayer, sometimes praying from 10 a.m. 10 p.m. till 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning in their little cottage. And as the prayer intensified, other ministers gathered with them every Tuesday and Thursday. During one of these prayer sessions, uh, God showed Peggy and Christine that a Scottish preacher 
called Duncan, Duncan Campbell to visit them. And he would be used to bring about revival. And so there's a photograph of those two pioneers, those warriors in prayer. Those old ladies are with Duncan Campbell. After a series of events, Duncan arrived for a two-week visit. And the visit lasted for over two years. One night at the very beginning, around 30 people gathered at this cottage to pray. About three, three o'clock in the morning, God swept in. And about a dozen were laid prostrate on the floor, just like Wesley described 200 years earlier. As they left the cottage that morning, they found men and women seeking God. No one was sleeping. Three men were found by the roadside in conviction, crying for God to have mercy upon them. Hallelujah. The whole island was shaken. The next night, buses came from the four, four corners of the islands, crowded into this little church. Seven men were being driven to the meeting in a butcher's truck. And suddenly the Spirit of God fell upon them with great conviction, and they committed their lives to God and were converted in the butcher's truck before they even got to the church. As Duncan preached, a wave of conviction swept over the congregation. Cries were heard all over the place. The meeting closed, and people began to move out. As the last person was about to leave, a young man, a teenager, he stood up to pray. And he prayed fervently, and he prayed for three quarters of an hour. And as he prayed, people kept gathering and gathering and gathering until there were twice as many people outside the church as inside. They streamed back into the church. The meeting lasted until 4 a.m. It was reported, and I quote, hardened sinners were saved. Right. As the meeting was closing, someone hurried up to the preacher, very excited. He said, come with me. There's a crowd of people outside the police station. They're weeping and in awful distress. We don't know what's wrong with them, but they're calling for someone to come and pray for them. Describing the scenes outside the police station, one of the ministers said this. He said, I saw a sight I never thought was possible. Something I shall never forget. Under the starlit sky, Men and women were kneeling everywhere, by the roadside, outside the cottages, even behind the peat stacks, crying for God to have mercy upon them. Revival had come. God came down and shook the heavens. The revival lasted for two years. It said that around 90% of the people were saved. I wonder what you make of those stories. We can, have, we can be cynical about these things, we can have all sorts of views, or we can be people of faith. And we can, number one, be inspired and excited, and number two, we can say, as Kev said in the prayer meeting, he's done it before, he can do it again. And as we read these stories, and as we reflect back to the book of Acts, I want to suggest there are certain common elements in each of the revivals that I've mentioned and many more uh, which we also see during the birth of the church in the first century and revivals I believe are times where the gospel of grace is clearly proclaimed. It's not a legalistic gospel, it's not a liberal gospel, it's when God's love and God's truth and God's power are combined. It's a place where we understand that Jesus' death on the cross is the only solution to the problem of our fallen nature. And because of that, we have a reverence which can perhaps sometimes be missing if we are inclined to abuse the grace of God. Secondly, there's evidence of repentance. People turning away from their old lives, turning towards God, agreeing with God against themselves. This is seen through an overwhelming sense of recognizing I've got no ability to save myself. Understanding the bad news is that we can't save ourselves. And so what do we do? We fall on the mercy and the love and the grace of God. Thirdly, there's anointed corporate worship. Everyone knowing that as we worship together, God is there. God's presence. There's an overwhelming sense of the presence of God. Thirdly, sorry, fourthly, can't count. There's always church growth. Oh, our church is growing, we're having a revival. No, you can have church growth without a revival. What you can't have, though, is you can't have revival without church growth. 
because it comes as a result of Christians being so excited <laughs> by God, so revived by God, that the passion flows out of them and affects their friends and their neighbours and everyone around them. And finally, extraordinary prayer. Prayer beyond the ordinary. Prayers that are more for the kingdom than for ourselves. I truly believe that there is no revival without prayer. And I also believe that in times of revival, prayer is intensified because people are so stirred to pray. Now you might say, Terry, it's a great history lesson. But what's it got to do with us? Everything. Everything, yes, yes. Do you know what? Revival is ultimately up to the sovereignty of God. But as we think about these things which mark out revival, and if we agree that revivals include these five things, why don't we pursue these things with all our hearts? Then the rest is up to God in His power, and in His sovereignty, and in His grace, and in His truth. Let's pursue then a clear proclamation of the gospel of grace, the good news about Jesus. Let's pursue, let's not lose sight of the importance of repentance, of turning away from the rubbish stuff and turning in humility towards God. Thirdly, let's continue week after week to gather and worship, to seek after our anointed worship. Rich and team, thank you for leading us so powerfully, so beautifully this morning. We feel we're on the road, don't we? Yes. Well, let's continue. Let's and I'll ask God for worship times to be even more powerful. Amen. Fourthly, let's tell our friends, it's not just about us, is it? In fact, it's not about us at all, in one sense. Revival's always about others finding him. Let's play our part, and let's see God do the rest. And finally, and I believe vitally, perhaps most importantly, prayer. The foundation <coughs> of prayer. Prayer for the kingdom. Prayer, individual prayer. Prayer in small groups, just like those two sisters in the Hebrides, but also gathering of prayer. Prayer gatherings, a family gathering to pray, just like we did on Thursday night at prayer and feasting. Let's gather before our Father to seek Him. There is no revival without prayer. How much do we want it? And so with this in mind, we can ask Hillary to come. She's going to pray. I wonder whether someone could just alert the children to, uh, in a moment, once we finish praying, they will come back in. And so let's just close our eyes. I'm just going to ask Hillary to pray for us. But before we do, as we've got our eyes closed, I'm just going to read the words of Jesus, which seem appropriate as we pray. Jesus says this, So I say to you, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. You know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? That's right. Please, if you wouldn't mind, would you stand? I would love to honour our Father God for what He has done in the whole of this nation in times gone by. And with that in mind, I'm just going to stay silent for a minute so that we can individually respond personally to what we have heard this morning.
thank you, Father, for how you have moved in the past. But I know you are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Your heart must be always towards the revival and renewal of individuals, of communities, of churches, and of nations. Please, Father, come again. And Father, I have to own up for being so often a sleepy Christian. Please forgive me. Please never let me fall asleep spiritually. Jesus, I am so sorry that at times I am hardly a fervent Christian, more like a nominal Christian, a Christian in name only, but not so much a Christian in what I do or what I think or what I say. Please change me. And Holy Spirit, I need your help. Amen. Please come again Amen. with power on me, Amen. on us, on this community, Amen. on this town, on this country, and on this nation. But my prayer for each of us is, Jesus, take me as I am. I can come no other way. Take me deeper into you. And make me more wholly yours. I pray this in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and for their honour and glory alone. Amen. Thank you so much. Let's take our seats. Thank you to her for leading us. I want to just give opportunity. If people feel stirred by anything that's been shared, whether it be prophetically or during the preaching or just generally, you know, the spirit of work in you, then I just want to encourage you as guys, John, Julie, Gemma, and Andy are available. They'll be at the front here. They're more than happy to pray for you. Do come and receive prayer for them if you would like. There might be other needs, other things that you've not even, that nothing has been mentioned, but you know you could do with someone praying for you. So that, that exists as a possibility. As always, we conclude with the kids coming. So uh, we, we revert back to last week when